Good morning, family, and welcome to church this morning. If you are in the building, would you please stand with us? If you are joining us online, good morning and welcome to Bramley. Let's just take a minute now. If you are comfortable, feel free to go and say good morning to someone around.
Thank you, God, that you're roaring in power, Lord Jesus, Father God. And you're fighting our battles for us. Church, can we just continue to worship our God in this place? Amen. Hallelujah. For he's great.
Thank you that you give us life every single day, Lord. Father, I pray now as we continue to worship, Lord, that you would just fill this place. We know you are here, God. I just pray that every person in this room this morning would just feel your presence in such a powerful way this morning, Lord God. Father, allow whatever could be preventing us from worshiping you this morning, allow that to just lay at the foot of your cross, Lord, and just surrender all to you today. We thank you, God, for who you are, for what you are doing in this place. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you. 
what's coming up at Bramley in the next few weeks. Fall is around the corner. It brings yet another opportunity to bless kids at Knightsbridge and Lisa with needed school supplies. Our backpack drive will happen on August 27th for Knightsbridge and August 28th for Lisa. Last year we gave away 232 backpacks. This year we are hoping for more than 300 bags. If you want to donate any school supplies we will be collecting it on Sunday August 14th and August 21st from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. in the atrium. You can also bring school supplies from August 16 to August 19 during office hours. Please contact me at pkrishnan@bramley.org or wins at the church office for more information. Thank you for your partnership in the local missions. to get our bodies to do and we ran some drills so we learned how to do slam pass out pass and the fly so right now I'm just getting behind me we're running a couple of scrimmage games since the weather isn't that nice outside and we're going to be running some football inside the gym finished creative camp and it was super fun. We did breakout rooms for today and some live worship. The kids are in their own groups and they're making a team cheer, team banner and team name. We talked about what our team name would be, which is Team Canada Drive because God keeps us refreshed <laughs> and at the same time we want to say cheers to the Lord with our Canada Drive.
Hey, BBC. I know August has just begun, but that means fall is around the corner. We have welcomed so many children and youth into our church this summer, and we're excited to continue to see them grow as we move into the fall. To do that, we need your help. We need leaders, specifically over the age of 18, who are feeling encouraged to pour into our children and youth. There are many ways to serve in these ministries. For kids, we have Sunday mornings, and this fall, we will resume our midweek zone out program. In our two youth ministries, Rooted for Junior High and Starting Line for Senior High, you can serve in the areas of small group leading and teaching, as well as hospitality and being a trip chaperone. To register to serve, please check out our serve links on the Bramley website under BBC Kids, Rooted, and Starting Line, or you can contact me directly in the church office. I uh, just hope and pray that you will take notice of that last announcement about uh, investing in the next generation. Uh, that's our future, amen? Uh, we're not the future. If you're old like me, uh, we got more behind us than in front of us on this earth. But uh, being around here and seeing uh, kids everywhere, and I just talked to Pastor Mark before the service, and he said they had a great week at camp this week, and so praise the Lord for that. We're so, yeah, let's clap about that. Yeah, amazing. He said it was just amazing, so I'm sure we'll hear a report on that in the next week or two. Uh, Let me pray, and then we're going to dive in. Father God, thank you for all that you are doing here uh, through the work of Bramley Baptist, and we are grateful today. Uh, Father, we love you. We ask that you would superintend and help your servant who's neither capable nor worthy of the task at hand, and uh, so would you just minister uh, this day, we pray. And uh, thank you for your goodness in every way and in every day. We pray in Jesus' name and for his glory, amen and amen. Open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Nehemiah chapter 4. My message this morning is entitled, Life According to Eeyore. Now, does anybody know who Eeyore is? Who is he? He's a donkey. He's a donkey from Winnie the Pooh. Who loves Winnie the Pooh? I love Winnie the Pooh. And Eeyore is always sort of discouraged. And life is always just a lot of ho-hum. And so this morning, I want to talk about discouragement and uh You may feel a little bit gloomy or pessimistic this morning. Uh, You may feel a bit like Eeyore, right? Which is funny on Winnie the Pooh, but it's not all that funny if you're living it out. And so let's look at the Word of God first, and then we're going to talk about discouragement. So by way of background, they've been working on the wall. Last week, uh, we talked about uh, in chapter uh, 3 how the... uh, The wall was going great, and then all of a sudden there was some opposition, and uh, and uh, you know these people that were just not happy with what was going on. We get into chapter four, and we talked about uh, how these guys opposed it, and they sort of were uh, threatening and making uh, light of what they were doing. And now we want to get to uh, what comes. The byproduct often of opposition is discouragement, right? You feel like you've got this pressure against you in your life, and sooner or later that manifests as discouragement. So hear the word of the Lord. We're going to begin reading at verse number 9, Nehemiah chapter 4. And we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. In Judah, it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There's too much rubble. By ourselves, we'll not be able to rebuild the wall. And our enemies said, they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. At that time, the Jews who lived near them came from all directions and said to us ten times, you must return to us. So in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall in open places, I stationed the people by their clans with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. 
And fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction and half held the spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. And the leader stood behind the whole house of Judah who were building on the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. And each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, The work is great and widely spread and we are separated on the wall far from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. This is God's word. And so today I want to talk about discouragement. Discouragement. Uh, Most of us go through some period of discouragement. You ever been through a time of discouragement in your life? Yeah. Maybe you're in one right now. You're kind of up against it. You feel discouraged. And often it can be a really unwelcome companion, and sometimes it lasts for long periods of of time in our lives. And for some, this can be significant, you know, life-hindering, even to the point of the discouragement moves into depression, and you're just really struggling and not functioning well. For others, it may just be, you know, you have a day where you feel kind of down in the dumps, or, you know, you feel a little bit uh, blue, or, you, you know, you, you just feel sort of just, just under the weather, if you will. And I have no uh, doubt this morning that we will solve significant issues, but my goal this morning is to give some context and maybe put some handles on this thing called discouragement that might help carry uh, you through the journey. Okay, so remember our context. We've just read again, the wall is being built. Everyone has found their spot. Now, they've spread out quite a bit on the wall, and so Nehemiah has said, hey, listen, we've got a person here with a trumpet, so if we come under attack, we'll blow the trumpet, and we'll gather together as a group. And you, you heard there that in one hand, they had their, their brick trowel, and they were doing work. In the other hand, they had their spear. And so, I mean, they're under some pressure, and we read of some discouragement. The rubble's great, we're failing, we're running out of steam. And so let's look at this, and uh, let's see what happens. And remember, in the midst of this, they're dealing with the mockery and the threats and all of that, right? Uh, In verse 8, we just read, they've said, hey, we're going to come and get you. You're not even going to know that we're here until we come and we infiltrate in your midst, and we're going to get you, and we're going to kill you. So imagine all of that. It's no wonder they're facing and feeling discouraged. So Nehemiah prays in verse 9 for the Lord's protection. And they get back to work. And that's where we find ourselves this morning. But look what happens in verse 10. In Judah, it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There's too much rubble. By ourselves, we'll not be able to rebuild the wall. Discouragement has set in. And sooner or later, I have found that any great undertaking that has potential for great kingdom impact, sooner or later, discouragement rears its head. And it threatens to derail the wall. And look what it said there. Look carefully what it said. This is when it's really tough. It's not one person. The verse begins with, in Judah it was said. There's starting to be widespread loss of momentum. Everybody's saying, oh my goodness gracious, we're not going to be able to finish this wall. We're we're failing. We're we're, we're, we're just wore out. We're done. They're discouraged. They're discouraged. So where does discouragement come from? Let me give you some ideas that maybe you can apply to your life. The first place that it comes from is when you lose your strength. When you lose your strength. Look at verse 10 again. The strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. Now, I want to suggest this morning that in life, we have three tanks that we run our lives on. Okay? And when we lose our strength and we feel discouraged, we need to look at these three tanks. One tank is our physical tank. 
One tank is our emotional tank. And then the third tank will come as no surprise, I think, to most of you. That is our spiritual tank. And we have to keep all of those tanks reasonably full because we live in a daunting, demanding world. And I would suggest you need to keep all those tanks at least three quarters full. Now, listen to this. People can actually run on two tanks for a while. You, you know, you can have a strong physical tank and a, and a fairly full emotional tank and let this spiritual tank run a bit dry and you can run. But you know what happens? If you're running on two tanks, just like if you've ever driven a big truck, a tractor trailer, and has tanks on both sides and you can switch back and forth, or if you flow in an aircraft that has multiple fuel tanks, you can switch back and forth. But when you switch off one of the tanks and there's nothing left in that tank, the remaining tanks drain quicker. It's a simple law of physics, right? So you can actually run on one tank less you can have an empty physical tank. You can just be just totally burned up and burned out physically. And you can sort of run on your emotional and your spiritual for a while. But those tanks will begin to drain because God has made us as holistic beings. He's the architect of us. And so he's made us physical beings. We're people that have emotions and obviously we have spiritual needs, communion with God. And so you've got to keep all of those tanks full. Now look carefully at verse 9. We see all three of these at play. The strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. That is the physical tank, emptying out. The task is huge and there's rubble, you know, bits and pieces of stone and rock are lying there and they're trying to rebuild this wall. And they've been at it for several weeks. And remember, these people are not bricklayers by trade. You know, this isn't what they do every day. Uh, Some of you may remember that some of them made perfume. Do you remember that? They were perfume makers. So, you know, laying bricks and big stones, that's a lot more physically demanding than making a bottle of Chanel number, well, I guess it would be Chanel number one, because this is a long time ago, right? Right? That's a lot less demanding, right? Just, just think of it. You know, many of us who are desk jockeys all day, all of a sudden for weeks we're out doing heavy labor construction and we're trying to figure this out and there's a steep learning curve and we've got pressure and we're fearful and everything and the physical tank begins to drain. Right? We, we live in a very fragile structure. And when the physical tank empties, we start to come undone and discouragement will come. Are you keeping your physical tank full? Are you eating properly? Do you get some exercise? Do you get enough sleep? You just cannot burn that down to the ground and expect that you're going to function well. Because if you do, discouragement and fear will come in. And it's often physically related. But look at the second thing there in verse 9. There is too much rubble. That is the emotional tank. Often you can tell when your emotional tank is empty in two areas of your life. It's manifest. When your emotional tank goes down, it's manifested in two ways. Relational challenges and fear. When your emotional tank begins to go down, emotional issues and fear become on the rise. And one of the key, lo- uh, key indicators of this is you lose perspective sometimes in relationships. You lose perspective in reality and fear comes to rest. Now here's what's really interesting about this. Here's what's really interesting about this. There is too much rubble. How do we know that they've lost track a little bit of reality? Because back in verse 6, we read that the wall is now half done. Right? That means there's half as much rubble as when they started. Because they've put half the wall back together again. But now they're saying there's too much rubble because their tanks are emptying. They're losing perspective on reality. 
Emotionally, they're not anchored anymore. They're emptying their emotional tank. And so the physical tank was now drained down, and now they're trying to run on these other tanks, and they're draining them even quicker. And then look at the, second, the third thing I want you to notice there. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. See, that's the spiritual tank. Now they're depending on themselves instead of depending on God. They were absolutely right. If you're discouraged today and you're saying, man, I, I just can't get through this. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. That's a, that's a correct statement. You, you probably can't get through it and you probably don't know what to do. And that's why you have to have a full spiritual tank. Amen? God will get you through. Don't take on what is not yours to take on and what is not yours to bear. That was the mistake of Tobiah in verse 3. He said, you know, if a fox runs on your wall, it'll fall over. Tobiah, it's not their wall. It's God's wall. This is God's deal, right? Don't make what is God's yours. Drain your spiritual tank by doing that. James Dobson says this. Listen to this. The body, the spirit, and the emotions are very close neighbors. What one experiences, the other will soon experience. These are interconnected. So let me ask you the, today, this morning, friends. What, what, is this, what is the level in your tanks this morning? Just think about that for a second. You know, if 10 is full... You know, physically, are you feeling like it's, your, your, your tank is full physically? What, what about the emotional, relationally? How are you doing with your relationships? And is fear sort of rolling around? That's your emotional tank. What about your spiritual tank today? Do you feel connected to the Lord? And we're going to talk about that a little bit more here in a minute. But here's the really important question. Not just where are you today, but is your tank over the next week? week or two weeks or month, is it more likely to fill or to continue to empty? Because if it's only half full today, if your spiritual tank is only half full, is it going to drain down further? You know, how many of us have a car that you're going down the highway and all of a sudden a little bink, a little light comes on, right? And you got to go buy some gasoline, or if you have a Tesla, you got to get a really long cord. Where, where, I lived, where I live in Cambridge, a guy st was stuck at a corner last week on the busiest corner in Cambridge with the most expensive Tesla, and the battery was completely dead. And so they couldn't push it, because I guess you can't push a Tesla. And, you know, they couldn't run an extension cord a mile. He was stuck. He had to, they actually had to pick the car up, right? So, so where are you? Are you draining your... If you're, if you're at a five in any one of your tanks, make a decision today. Hey, I have got to begin to refill this tank. My spiritual tank is, is half empty. My emotional tank, right? And they're interconnected. Secondly, how do you become discouraged? You lose not just your strength, you lose your anchor. You lose anchor. What's, what's your anchor? Your security. Your security. We, we, we generally like security, right? We may be open to some risk in some areas of our lives, but we, we need a sense that our stakes are going to hold, don't we? Well, we don't want our life totally adrift and, you know, sort of complete chaos. You, you know, you, you want to say, you know, my, my tent is going to hold. The stakes are driven. Now, you don't mind if you rearrange the campsite a bit, but you want to make sure that the tent is not going to blow over and it's going to hold. But sometimes in our lives, friends, big things change. The job is lost. We, we don't need you anymore. Th thanks for your service. Right? The relationship fails. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to move on. I don't want to be in this relationship anymore. Or deep loss comes into our life. Everything changes. A few months ago, I was on my way to a meeting. It was early on a Tuesday morning. My cell phone rang in my car. 
And I didn't recognize the number, but I answered it, and I said, hello, uh, who's this? And the guy on the other end says, hey, Steve, it's Todd. And I said, hey, Todd, how are you? And he said, not very good. And I knew right away the news was bad. And I said, oh, what's going on? And he said, last night my wife took her life and left five kids behind. I said, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. I said, I'll be there as quick as I can. I'll, I'll turn around. I was in Hamilton. I turned around. I drove to the house to meet all of these kids. And a few days later, did a funeral with almost 1,300 people at it. They'd lost anchor. Their security was gone. Now, how do you answer that, friends? You're here this morning, and maybe the anchor has seemed to pull free. The job's gone. The relationship's failed. There's some deep, deep discouragement has just come and fallen in onto your life like a storm in a harbor, and you don't know what to do. And, and frankly, let me just say this. I'm going to be straight up with you. The pat answers and the Christian cliches just don't work. And somebody says to you, well, you know, Romans 8.28 says that all good things work together. And you're like, if somebody says that one more time, I'm going to scream. Because all things do work together for good. But listen carefully, not all things are good in the moment. In the moment. So what do you do? What do you do when that happens? And I want you to know I don't have a silver bullet this morning. There are no easy answers, but listen. There's a loving God and a listening God. And when I've done funerals for suicides and buried children and been involved in things that are so crushing, I tell those folks, and I tell you this this morning, where is God in your weeping? He is weeping with you. Because he knows this world is broken. What do we do? Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? From the Lord. And you ask for the Lord's presence. And you ask for the Lord's comfort. Say, Lord, I am discouraged. I am hurting I am broken. I am crushed. Help me. Be with me. Several years ago, I went through a ministry burnout. And uh, I woke up one morning and I was just toast. I just was toast. I was telling the staff about this a few weeks ago. And I didn't know what had happened to me. And I went to see a wonderful Christian doctor, counselor, and I said, what's happened? He says, you're burned out, man. You just burned yourself out. I, I didn't pay close enough attention to the tanks, frankly. And so he said, you got to take time off. It was right in the middle of winter. It was actually it was right at Christmas time. And uh, I got up one morning. I went for a walk in the woods. And I was praying as I was walking. I said, Lord, I am so discouraged. I, I don't want to be off. I want to be doing ministry, but I know I can't do ministry. I need to take a season, a, a you know, break. And I was walking. And I was walking down this wooded path. And I said, Lord, just give me a sense that you're with me. I, I need a sense of your comfort, a sense of your presence. And as I was walking down this path, as close as I am to this, there's a little limb there, a little bright red cardinal landed right there. And he looked at me. I could have... <laughs> His eye is on the sparrow. I said, thank you, Lord. That's good enough. That bird just looked at me right there. I said, hi. He just looked at me. And I just sensed that was of the Lord. And I could praise him. Matt Redman wrote a song. Oh, it's probably 15 years or so ago. Brittany probably knows. Blessed be your name. 15 years or so ago, probably something like that. Yeah? 20 maybe. 
Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. We say amen when the sun, you know, and everything's going rosy and the streams are flowing and everything. But then he wrote this. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. See, God's still the same. Try and bless God in the desert, in the suffering. That is a higher level of worship, frankly. Declaring the worship of God when everything around us seems a bit gray. And if you cannot bless him in the suffering, tell him that. Say, Lord, I want to I bless you, I want to worship you, but I just am crushed. I uh, tell him that, you know, and, and that's not, a, you, know, you know, don't say, well, you know, I'm not going to say that because, you know, I should really be able to bless him. You know, David said in Psalm 9, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. In Psalm 11, he said, in the Lord I take refuge. But in the middle of that, in Psalm 10, David says this, why, O oh Lord, do you stand far, far away? Why do you hide yourself when I am in a time of trouble? There's times when you can say, God. I just don't feel like you're here, and I'm discouraged. I'm despondent. I need to know you're here. Make yourself known. I want to worship you. And when you feel adrift, tell the Lord. Okay? When you feel like the anchor's pulled away, he knows and appreciates that we can be honest with him. He already knows that. Did you know that? Has it ever occurred to you that nothing ever occurs to God? Some of you will get that at lunchtime. (laughs) Third way, how do you get discouraged? I need to move on. You lose your way. You lose your way. You become disconnected from God. You and the Spirit of God, you know, this you become disconnected. And it's like a couple that lives together in the same house, but they don't speak. Or or he lives on the... uh, you know, the second floor, and she lives on the first floor, or they're in the same dwelling, but, you know, and and there's three ways that that you can interface with the Holy Spirit, or lack thereof, I guess, right? You can engage the Spirit of God in your life, you can be ignorant of the Holy Spirit in your life, or you can be indifferent to it. And one day when life's questions and problems are bigger than your answers and you feel disoriented, and then what do I do? That that, that generally means that you're operating within the limits of your own understanding, right? And that's why in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 we say, we read, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on what? On your own understanding. If you engage and build the Holy Spirit relationship, you will recognize his voice. But the key is, listen carefully, you only recognize voices that are familiar to you. You will not recognize an unfamiliar voice when you need it most. Now let me take the next few minutes and spend some time on this spiritual aspect of discouragement. The spiritual aspect of discouragement. How do we respond from the perspective of an empty spiritual tank? First thing you do is you go back to the cross. You go back to the cross. God died for you, for you to experience his best in the midst of the world's worst. Israel did not have the benefit of the cross, of course, but they did have the benefit of remembering God's great work on their behalf in the past. And the cross is our place of remembrance. Look down there in Nehemiah 4.14. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. When your spiritual tank feels empty, go back to the cross and say, God, you are great and you are awesome. That you would die for me. That you would do that. Remember what Charles Wesley penned. Remember the great old hymn? Amazing love. How can it be 
that thou, my God, would what? Wouldst die for me. Amazing love. You go back to the cross. When you're discouraged, when you're despondent, go back to the cross. And when you go back to the cross, say, Lord, I don't know what's going on. I don't get it. But you know what you do? You present yourself as a living sacrifice. Say, Lord, you know what? I'm, I'm feeling like a, I'm a sacrifice here. You are a sacrifice. You're a living sacrifice, right? Holy and acceptable to God when you come back to him. No matter how wrecked you are and what mess you're in, you come back to him and you say, God, I'm back. Now, now you say, well, how could I even do that? My life's wrecked, right? Well, because at the beginning of Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it tells us how we do that. He said, uh, Paul writes, we do that by the mercies of God. We remember that God is merciful. And he's so overwhelmingly kind. God is a God of mercy founded on love. Secondly, what do we do to fill that spiritual tank? We live in today with an expectant tomorrow. Live in the day. You can only live today, today. I know that seems rudimentary, but it's true. And you know what Satan does? I want you to worry about tomorrow. I want you to worry about next week. I want you to be discouraged about what the future is. And all of a sudden, and you know when that happens, here's what I encourage you to do. When that begins to come, you say, Satan, I am not letting you walk around in my head today. There's no place for you. Because he who is in me is greater than he who is in the world, and that's you, Satan. Amen? He's so much greater. Say, Satan, no, 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 hold on. Straight arm Satan. No, I'm not giving you that privilege, Satan. And then you live with an expectant tomorrow. You think about what will be, not what could be. Remember I I quoted, I think a week or two ago, I quoted Paul in Philippians 3.13. He says, brothers and sisters, I have not yet comprehended. In other words, I haven't got this figured out. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. Pressing forward. Because Paul, he's got some stuff in his past. Some messy stuff. But he says, you know what? I'm going to press forward. So you live with an expectant tomorrow. Today might not be the best day, but there is hope for tomorrow. Next, what do you do to fill your spiritual tank? You let God love you through others. You let God love you through others. Go and read. I won't do it this morning for the sake of time, but go and read Exodus 17. You know, Moses is struggling, leading a a rebellious Israel in the Exodus, right? And they've traveled from the valley of of sin to Rephidim, and there's no water. And they're like, we should have just stayed in Egypt, man. Why did we let Mo lead us out here? Dude, what are you doing? Come on. And they're doing what, uh, you know, we do when we're teenagers, murmuring. Isn't that a great word? Murmuring. We used to say to my, I used to say to my kids, are you murmuring? Such a great word. And of course, we know that he's given water by striking the rock at Horeb. And then they go into battle with Amalek, right? Right? And Moses goes up on a hill with Aaron and her, his brother and his brother-in-law. And the battle's waging down below. And how do they advance in the battles? Anybody remember? What happens? Those two men say, Moses, we're going to hold up your arms. Some of you here this morning, friends... You need to be an Aaron and a her for a brother or sister in Christ. And say, I know you're in a battle. And I want you to prevail. And I'm going to pour the love of Christ into you through me. And I'm going to help hold up your arms so that you can prevail. Because one day, you know what's going to happen to you? Somebody's going to hold up your arms. That's what it means to be part of a, a family. It's a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful picture of how we can serve one another. Billy Graham said this, The Christian life is not a constant high. I have my moments of deep discouragement. I have to go to God 
in pr- with prayer in prayer with tears in my eyes and say god help me or forgive me finally this listen and learn in the midst of the storm listen and learn in the midst of the storm our current christianity has made pain uh, seen as unacceptable and abnormal. If any of you have read any of the writing, I had a chance to meet this gentleman, John Perkins, amazing man. He's uh, one of the last living legends of uh, black reconciliation in the South. He marched with Martin Luther King and uh, amazing man, amazing, well into his 90s now. Uh, he's just finished a new book called Count It All Joy. Interesting title from a man whose son in the 60s was beaten to death by a white police chief because his son had the audacity to reach out and grab the nightstick that the police chief was beating him with. So he beat him tonight to death. And then John Perkins himself was nearly beaten to death, but he wrote a book, his, and this was his, sort of his, his opus, I would say, called Count It All Joy. Listen to this quote from the book. Suffering is not the failure of faith, but the pathway to faith. Isn't that powerful? It's not the, it's not the abnormal or the unacceptable. And don't, don't, and let me just encourage you this. Do not confuse Satan's desire for us to feel beat up with God allowing us to be broken in love and rebuilt more like him. That's a wholly different experience. We assume when we are in strange surroundings that we've lost the still small voice. But remember Isaiah 30, 21, right? You'll hear this voice behind you. This is the way, walk ye in it. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. God says, you know what? I won't take you out of the despair and the discouragement, but I'll guarantee you this, I will meet you in it. If you're discouraged, despondent today, God is with you in the midst of that. And when we lose certain things, we often just start searching, looking around frantically, right? That's what we do. Years ago, my wife had our youngest son. He was a toddler, and he was in the grocery cart in the grocery store, and he's starting to fuss in the grocery cart. So she's like kind of panicked, what do I do? And so she gave him the car keys, you know, shake the car keys. You know, so he's shaking the car keys, shaking, shaking. You're in the grocery store. This is in the U.S., shaking, shaking. And then he did this. And those babies went like three aisles over. So she... They dismantled half the grocery store. We were never allowed in again. (laughs) But she went to look where she thought they had landed, right? But when you're in the darkness, you, you don't even know where to land, and you can't see well enough to even see how to move forward. And in those times of discouragement, darkness, despair, we cannot see. So what do we do when we cannot see? That's when we listen. We listen for the voice of God in the midst of the pain. And he builds us through the brokenness. And that's not to say that being broken in life isn't painful and difficult. It is. But brokenness, friends, and often that's found in discouragement, is the emptying of us so we can be more filled with the Spirit of God. It's beautiful. It's Moses telling God that there is no way he can lead Israel. And God says, you're right, but I'll use you anyway. It's David crying out to God, acknowledging his sin. He's so broken, but God is going to call him back to a place of kingdom building. It's Job searching for God amidst unimaginable unimaginable despair as God allows him to be used for his glory. It's Peter failing in the courtyard of Caiaphas so he can be humbled to be used. It is a blind Paul being taken by the hand on the Damascus road with a better and more brilliant God-oriented future. If you're discouraged, you feel broken, you feel in despair and despondent, learn and listen. God is building you in into something greater for his glory. Amen? (laughs) 
And just as you journey through it, keep in mind, get on Google this afternoon and go type in this, broken hearted in the Bible and see how many times that comes up. The Lord is near to the broken hearted. Right? He heals the broken hearted. C.S. Lewis said this, When I invited Jesus into my life, I thought he was going out to put up I thought he was going to put up some wallpaper and hang a few pictures. But he started knocking out walls and adding on rooms. I said, I am expecting a nice cottage. But he said, I am making a palace in which to live. So that's what he's doing. He's making you into a better place of his dwelling. And remember this, remember this. It's not how God turns out for you. You're discouraged and you're saying, man, Lord, I don't know, I'm just struggling. It's not how God turns out for you, it's how you turn out for God. He's preparing you to live in eternity with him. Did you know that? Right? And say, God, you know what, I don't know why all this is happening, but if it would be your pleasure, would you rebuild me from this time to be more like you and look more like Jesus? I have been a Christian for 49 years, and I've come to realize this. I've seen so many people with what I call unshakable faith. Have you ever heard that? Boy, that man's got unshakable faith. That woman, boy, she's got unshakable faith. Listen to this very carefully. Unshakable faith comes from a faith that was once shaken. That's where it comes from. That's where unshakable faith comes from. It comes from a time in your life where you're rattled to the point, and then you realize that the anchor holds. Amen. It holds. It holds. Back to our text. The words of Nehemiah. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome. Amen? Be encouraged. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. Father, great are you and awesome. And Father, I just want to pray a special petition this morning. For those folks here who are discouraged and they're up against it. They've had obstacles and that's turned into discouragement and fear. They may feel like some of their tanks are empty this morning. And Father, would you minister to them in a very special way and give them a special portion of you. Would you reveal yourself in a new and fresh way even this day so that they know that you are with them and you as you have promised, will never leave them nor forsake them. Father God, we trust you, even when things do not make sense, and the clouds roll in, and our hearts are crushed, and we feel weak. It is then, Lord, that we depend on you. We love you, Lord. We want you to hear that from our lips this morning. Amen. And amen. We are going to go right into communion, brothers and sisters. So I would like to invite up two of our elders are going to come and are going to pray uh, for us this morning. So Neville and Anthony. Here's Neville and Anthony's coming. Let me just very briefly, just very briefly, I want to take you over to the Gospel of John. Verses that we've all heard. This is a beautiful place on a Sunday we're talking about discouragement. Jesus in the upper room says to his disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Have you heard those verses before? And we often read those verses, we extract those out. Those verses come on the heels, if you look at chapter 13, they come on the heels of Peter being singled out that he is going to fail Jesus and deny Jesus. And all of those disciples must be sitting there, wow, if Peter's going to make a mess of this, what about us? Because he seems to be like the guy that's just full of enthusiasm and passion and go, and he's so keen about the Lord. 
And so they're sitting there long faced saying, man, if Peter's going to mess this up, what about us? And Jesus says, let not your hearts be, don't be discouraged. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm going to prepare a place, and this is not all that is for you. And so this morning, let us cling to that reality. I said we go back to the cross, and that's what we're going to do now. We're going to go back to the cross. That's what communion is. And I need some communion elements. I just realized that. So, okay, sorry about that. So what, what we want to do is go back to the cross. Go back to the cross. Where the Prince of Glory died for us. And so we are going to pray for the bread, the body of Christ. So Brother Neville, I'm going to invite you to do that for us now. Dear Heavenly Father, you remind us in Matthew 7, what earthly father when their son asks for bread, gives them stone. But you, being our Heavenly Father, will give us gifts when we ask good gifts. And you give us good and perfect gifts. And this wafer is a reminder of that perfect gift that you gave us by having your son die on the cross. And I pray for each of us that we be able to examine our lives and be able to mm -hmm. be thankful for that amazing gift. And I pray that you give each one of us, if we are discouraged, that we are able to have that hope that we can only have because of what your son did on the cross. And may, may we never forget that. May we always be in gratitude for that. And we commit this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Read in the Gospel of Mark that as they were eating, he took bread, the Lord Jesus. And after blessing it, he broke it and he gave it to them. And he said, take, this is my body. And every time we do this, we're taken back to the cross and remember that God is great and awesome, and through the Lord Jesus, we found our way home. Amen? Amen. Amen. Brother Anthony's going to pray for the cup. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning, Lord, for the opportunity to partake of this communion table. We thank you for this juice, Father God, that represents your blood. As we listen to the songs that were sung up here from the worship team, that, Lord, your blood breaks a chain. Father God, we thank you for that precious blood that was shed, that, Lord, we could stand here worthy this morning in this congregation, and we pray for those who are online. We pray that you bless the emblem that they have in their homes as they participate with us, Lord. We thank you, Father God, for the emblem, for your precious blood that was shed, that, Lord, all sins could be forgiven, because the Bible is clear that the sh without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sin. So we thank you, Father God, that your blood was shed so that our sins could be forgiven. And Father God, we pray that in this season, Lord, as we go forward and as we come back to this altar to pray for the elements, the, the emblems, Lord, we pray that COVID is still hanging around. And Father God, we pray for those in our congregation that are that have overcome with COVID, that some of them are not even in this building this morning. Father God, we pray that your precious blood that was shed, Lord, will heal, will restore. And Father God, we thank you that this morning as we listen to the message, that because of your shed blood, your anchor, you are our anchor, and we thank you this morning for blessing us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. And he took a cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remissions of sin. But this is the once and for all perfect lamb of blood, lamb of God, blood, shed forever. Amen? Shed for us.
and we remember this day. Father God, you are good. We've come back to the cross this morning, Lord. We sort of can sense that we're in that little upper room. And may our hearts not be troubled because you are preparing a place for us. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. And amen. Let's lift our voices to the King of Kings. Our prayer team will be here, and if you're discouraged today, come forward. We'd love to lift you up to to the Lord in prayer and just try and uh, encourage you in that. And so just don't be shy. Just come forward. This is what we do. This is what we do. Brothers and sisters, we want to hold your arms up this day in prayer. Amen. The atrium's open. Love to see you over there for a cup of coffee. Paul writes in the book of Romans, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe, for the Jew and also for the Gentile. Amen? Amen. Let us go and live accordingly. You are dismissed. God bless. Have a great week in the Lord.